Welcome to Bible. Today we're going to talk about uh, the Judgment Hall, which is what happened next after the Garden of Gethsemane. So the enemies had just taken Jesus away and now he was going to be judged. So let's learn what happens next. So that night the mob of enemies took away Jesus and they took him to the judgment hall to see Cephas, which was a priest, and all the other Sanhedrin and religious leaders were there waiting for them to bring back Jesus. Once they brought back Jesus, they went ahead and they went and put him on trial. Now, mind you, this is all happening in the middle of the night, which means that it is late. It's probably after midnight. And all these religious leaders have been thinking up ways that they could get rid of their enemy, Jesus, all this time since he entered into the city. And now they had finally taken him captive and were able to take him for judgment. Now, during this time, they could judge someone, but to sentence someone to death, it had to be approved only by the Roman governor, which at that time was Pilate. It was not legal for them to hold the trial during the middle of the night. But they figured that this would be best because it would prevent those who love Jesus from being around and seeing what they were doing. So Peter and all the other disciples had run away and scattered from Jesus. They did not stick with him during this time in need. So Jesus stood alone, friendless, in the midst of, those Jewish, of these Jewish priests and rabbis who all hated him. They kept questioning him, trying to trap him and make him condemn himself. They brought even false witnesses against him to lie about him, even though he had did nothing wrong while he had been on earth. They were very anxious to find Jesus guilty so they could get Pilate, the Roman governor, to sentence him to death. So the high priest said, I demand in the name of the living God that you tell us whether you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Yes, Jesus said, I am. Angry, the high priest tore their clothes as they often did during this day to show they were grieved or horrified. And they shouted, blasphemy. We don't need other witnesses. You have all heard him make this claim. What is your verdict? And they all shouted, death, death. He deserves death. And they spit in his face. They struck him with sticks, blindfolded him and slapped him and mocked him saying, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you that time? Remember, during this time, Jesus was all by himself. None of his disciples were around. But T Peter did have the chance to tuck himself away, just far enough away so that he wasn't noticed but so that he could see what was going on with Jesus. So it was long past midnight by this time. And again, Peter had joined the soldiers and servants who had built a fire in the courtyard. Now, while Peter was warming himself by this fire, there was a servant girl who came over and said, you were with Jesus, weren't you? For both of you are from Galilee. Peter got scared when he heard this. He thought that he too might be arrested and perhaps even killed if they found out he was a follower of Jesus. So Peter denied it loudly. I don't even know what you're talking about, he said angrily. Peter felt very uneasy. Soon after, another servant girl recognized him and those standing around, and she came up to him and said, this man was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter heard this remark and it filled him with terror. He felt he must convince these people that he was not a friend of Jesus. So with an angry oath, he said, I don't even know what you're talking about. After a while, some of the bystanders came over to Peter and said, we know you are one of, the, of Jesus's disciples. We can tell by your Galilean speech. More fearful than ever, Peter began to curse and swear. I don't even know the man, he said. Immediately as he said those words, Peter remembered what Jesus had told him. The rooster crowed 
and he had denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. His hands bound. Um, suddenly looking up, he saw Jesus. Peter saw Jesus. His hands were bound. He had marks of sorrow on his face. At that moment, the Lord looked upon Peter and their eyes met. Peter was filled with sorrow and grief. He jumped to his feet and he rushed out of the courtyard and he wept bitterly. As we think of Peter's denying Jesus, we might say, mm, what a shame. That was a man that was with Jesus for almost three years and in the time that he needed him most, he denied him, didn't even act like he knew him. But this was not sudden. Although it seems sudden here, it wasn't sudden. It's what we call backsliding. It's a gradually going down. Notice the different steps of Peter's downfall. First, he bragged that he would never, ever deny Jesus or go back on him. He was self-confident, thinking that he was strong enough in himself to be loyal to Jesus in the face of terrible temptation. Second thing, he failed his master in the garden. Remember when Jesus went to pray, he took Peter, James, and John with him and he asked them to stay and pray while he went a little bit further to pray. But did they stay and pray? No, they fell asleep when they should have been praying. We call that prayerlessness. And the third way is he followed afar off. So when the enemies had taken Jesus, he was way off so that nobody could know that he was actually following to see what would happen to his Lord. He should have been close to his Lord. The fourth way, he was the with the wrong crowd. So while he was away far off, off trying to see what the enemies were doing with Jesus, he was actually with the enemies. He was surrounded by the enemies and with them, acting as if he was one of them. Instead of speaking up for Christ, he stayed silent because he was scared. So three times he denied the Lord not having the courage uh, in the hour of testing. He had a great opportunity at that moment, especially being with the enemies, to share with them what Jesus had done and who Jesus was, but he didn't. Let us look into our own hearts and see if these danger signals are there and ask God to keep true, keep us true to him and never let us deny him in any way or at any time. It's so easy for us to think that we are strong and we will never deny Jesus, but be careful. If you're thinking, oh, I would never believe, behave like that. Let that be a warning for you, for you too may fall into sin. All of us must realize that if we're going to be true to Jesus, it's absolutely necessary that we pray and we read his word every single day. This is the way that we stay close to God instead of following him from afar off. This will keep us from being lukewarm, mediocre Christian and should set us on fire for the Lord. Feeding on his word and praying make us strong in our souls. Now, so many times like Peter, we are tempted to possibly hang out with the wrong crowd of people, maybe people that don't believe in Jesus, don't want to talk about Jesus, maybe people that like to watch dirty jokes or play dirty things or um, watch things on TV or the computer or try to get you to even do those things with them. The Bible says that we are to avoid those people and have nothing to do with them. We need to choose our friends carefully and prayerfully. We need to pick those who are interested in good, wholesome things. So during the night, now remember, mind you, it's very, very late, probably past midnight by now, and they were giving Jesus his judgment. The high council of the Jewish people had decided that Jesus must die, but they would need to have to persuade the Roman governor, Pilate, to sentence him to death. Because remember, they couldn't sentence anyone to death without the Roman governor, Pilate, approving it. So Jesus' trial before Cephas, the high priest, be ended in the early hours of the morning. So early the next morning, Jesus was pushed and dragged into the midst of a jeering mob. 
to Pilate's palace. Because it was the Passover feast, the Jews would not go into Pilate's judgment hall. So the governor spoke to them as they stood. Uh, governor spoke to them as they stood in the courtyard. And there standing before his, his this hysterical, angry crowd of religious leaders was the son of God. They shook their fists and loudly shouted the worst of accusations as they cursed and they swore at him. Pilate was surprised as he looked at the prisoner. He had expected to see a violent, rebellious criminal before him, but what stood before him was calm, quiet, dignified, a man showing his face tender love for those who hated him so. And when Pilate finally quieted the raging mob, he asked the chief priest, what charges do you bring against this man? What has he done wrong? They all shouted, he's a criminal, he's a liar, he's an imposter. He says he's the son of God. He claims to be a king. And then Pilate responded, well, take him yourselves and try him by your own religious laws. And they shouted back, but we want him to be crucified and your approval is required. Pilate was amazed that Jesus' peaceful face, at Jesus' peaceful face and quiet calmness. He thought to himself, certainly he acts like God's son and he is behaving himself like a king. I'll ask him, Jesus, are you really God's son and are you truly his king? Jesus replied, yes, I am. The furious mob led by the religious leader screamed, you heard him, you heard him make that preposterous claim. He is lying. He is no more a king than we are. Crucify him. Pilate turned to the chief of priests and the raging mob and declared, I find no fault with this man. And the crowd was furious. Governor, if you don't let us crucify Jesus, we'll report you to Caesar. We'll tell him you have another king to whom you are loyal and you'll lose your job. And with that, Pilate was too much of a coward to set Jesus free. That did it. Pilate was trying to be on two sides at one time, which really you can't do. Pilate didn't want Jesus killed because he was convinced that Jesus was innocent. But yet, Pilate was so selfish and ambitious that he didn't want to get into trouble with his boss or his leader, Caesar, the Roman emperor who had given him this job. He wanted to remain governor. He wanted to remain getting the money that he received for being the governor of the people. So then weak, cowardly Pilate had another idea. He told the crowd, you have a custom that I released one person from prison each year at this time, at the Passover. I'll release Jesus. No, they yelled. Away with this man and release the robber Barabbas. What then shall I do with Jesus? Pilate asked. Crucify him. So for the third time, Pilate asked, why? What evil has he done? And their only answer was, crucify him. So Pilate gave the awful command, take him out and scourge him. He probably thought if the soldiers, if he let the soldiers lash Jesus with this cruel Roman whip, that they would forget about killing him. The scourge on Jesus, used on Jesus, was a rod with nine leather straps. On those nine leather straps, woven into the straps were sharp pieces of glass, metal, and bone. He suffered as lash after lash fell on his naked back. Soon his flesh was cut to ribbons and blood flowed down his whole body. Hundreds of years before, the prophet Isaiah had said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the punishment of our peace was upon him. The cruel and hateful soldiers blindfolded Jesus, doubled their fists and hit him, slapped him in the face and they spit on him and Jesus allowed them to do it. They all began to mock him. You claim to be a king? All right, we'll dress you up like a king. So they draped a purple robe of, over his bloody shoulders saying a king is supposed to wear a royal, a royal robe and ah oh, yes a crown 
but they didn't give him a crown with gold and jewels. They took long, sharp, thick thorns, plated them into a crown, and they pressed that crown down on Jesus' head until blood down, ran down his face. They made him hold a weed, a weed as a scepter, and they knelt before him mock in mockery. All hail the king, they yelled. You're not our king. And they spit on him again, and they grabbed sticks, and they beat him on his head. So after they had done their worst, they left. They led their bleeding prisoner back to the judgment hall. Pilate saw him. He brought out. He brought him out to where the people could see him. What a pitiful sight he was, Pilate said. Look at the man. The crowd had no pity for Jesus. They shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate was about to let the people have their way with Jesus, but he didn't want the blame for putting Jesus to death. So he took a basin of water, washed his hands as if to wash away his guilt. And he said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. So the Jewish leaders were willing to take the blame. So they shouted, his blood be on us and our children. What a responsibility. Pilate, knowing that all hope was gone and that the people would never agree to releasing Jesus, let them have their way. Pilate sentenced Jesus to death by crucifixion. Today, hundreds of years later, the question Pilate asked the mob of people comes to every boy, every girl, every man, every woman. What shall I do then with Jesus? Many of us have heard about Jesus all of our lives. Are we, will, are we still saying, I know I ought to receive Jesus as my savior, but, I will, but will, what will my friends say? Or I'm going to wait until I'm older or until I have my good time and have done some things that I want to do that maybe he might not want me to do. So if you have never invited him into your heart as your savior, don't wait any longer. Trust him now before it is too late. 